Yeah, hello everyone and welcome. Welcome to our third event this year in the Indigenous Speakers Series. Uh, as I'm sure many of you know, this series is supported by the Waterloo Indigenous Student Centre, the Department of History, the Department of Communication Arts, and the Faculty of Arts as a whole. It's important, as always, that we, I guess, with an introduction, I'm Sheila Aker, I'm the Dean of Arts, in case you didn't know. Um, but actually what's important is that we begin with our territorial acknowledgement. The Faculty of Arts acknowledges that we live and work on the traditional territory of the neutral, Anishinaabeg, and Haudenosaunee peoples. The University of Waterloo is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River. Increasingly, we read this statement at the beginning of public events hosted by the university, uh, as we certainly should. But we don't always flesh it out for full understanding. So I thought I'd add a little bit of context. In 1784, Frederick Haldeman, the British appointed governor of Quebec, which included what is now Ontario, signed a decree that granted a tract of land to the Haudenosaunee, <clears throat> excuse me, also known as the Six Nations, for their alliance with British forces during the American Revolution. The Haldeman Tract extends by 10 kilometers on both sides of the Grand, R Grand River from its source in Dundalk Township to its mouth at Lake Erie. Originally, as you can see on the map in the green, this territory may have amounted to up to a million acres, roughly 4,000 square kilometers. Today, the Six Nations Reserve comprises about 46,500 acres just under 200 square kilometers, 5% of the original Haldeman Tract. Today we are super fortunate to welcome Jean Becker, UW's new Senior Director of Indigenous Initiatives. I am very excited to have Jean here for a conversation with us all, a conversation that's going to be enhanced and facilitated by our friend and colleague, Laurie Campbell, Director of the Waterloo Indigenous Student Center. As many of you know, Jean has a long history of associations with our community, uh, both at Wilfrid Laurier University and at the University of Waterloo, particularly with St. Paul's University College. I don't want to preempt what others, including Jean herself, would like to say by way of both introducing or reintroducing Jean and exploring what immediate and long-term priorities will emerge as we all move forward. So what I thought I'd do today is signal to Jean and to everyone our enthusiasm and commitment to moving forward on the university's indigenization initiatives. Speaking on behalf of the Faculty of Arts, I want to say that while I do believe that the University of Waterloo has sincerely committed itself to an indigenization strategy, I think that we all need assistance and leadership and guidance in this realm. This means that I, as Dean, need to understand how best to move this forward and I'm going to be calling on Jean and on Lori and on our other colleagues to help us do so. Conversely, I also want to let Jean and Lori and the institution as a whole know that the Faculty of Arts is 100% on board with a strategy of indigenization and that we are eager to share in the initiatives that Jean will be leading. So it's time for me to get off the stage, uh, but before I do, I'm very pleased to announce uh, that we have a community and student drumming group who are going to sing us a song, and I think I'm going to hand that over to Lori now. Awesome. Thank you, um, Sheila. Uh, if I could call up uh, anybody who uh, will be drumming and singing with us um, this evening. So uh, oftentimes you hear that we have sort of the University of Waterloo Indigenous Student Singer Group. Um, today on campus, uh, the Indigenous Student Association had, uh, has received a, re uh, a grant for a project. And so one of the outcomes of the grant was an Indigenous Youth Leadership Symposium, which they ran today. And so we have a lot of special guests, uh, community from community on campus here today. And I think we have some youth that are, that are still here that uh, were attended the events today and are, are gonna be joining us this evening. The, the song we're going to sing today is called uh, The Women's Warrior Song. And um, it's a song that we've been uh, singing a lot in the last uh, few weeks in uh, solidarity with um, what's going on out in Wet'suwet'en. 
And um, it's kind of this song that's kind of like um, echoing back and forth across the land. And, uh, you know, as we're doing it, it's, we're recording it and kind of sending it back and forth to each other and trying to, you know, provide support through that energy and through the spirit of the song. So I know that over the last few weeks that uh, in the spaces we've been singing it, we've been um, encouraging people to sing it with us. So, and I know there's people in the room that do know it now. Um, so uh, I, I would encourage anybody who's able to stand up um, as we do sing this song in solidarity and uh, join in as, as you are able to in the song as well. Thank you. That was awesome. I think that's the uh, most singers we've had in here for an event, and uh, that just sounded beautiful. I'm glad that was recorded. And uh, thank you for participating and uh, um, showing solidarity in that. So now on to uh, you know the rest of the evening and, and really why we're all gathered here. So I'm, I'm uh, you know going to introduce Jean. Uh, Jean Becker is a Nook and is a member of the Nunatsia Vut Territory of Labrador. It's hard for a Cree to say, but I, I tried to practice. Uh, she has lived in Ontario for 40 years and has been involved in grassroots, urban, indigenous community building throughout that time in Wellington and Waterloo regions. Jean is currently a member of the Mayor's Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Task Force in Kitchener and a member of the Wellbeing Waterloo Region First Nations Métis and Inuit Advisory and Ad Ad Advocacy Circle. <clears throat> She's actively involved in Indigenous ceremonies and advocacy work for Indigenous peoples outside of the academy locally and nationally. Jean is passionate about seeking ways to decolonize the academy, and we're very excited she is here. Um, as as uh, Sheila mentioned earlier, Jean does have uh, roots in this institution and uh, was here, I believe, at what was the inception of the Waterloo Indigenous Student Centre. 
And um, it's truly a pleasure to have her come back in this uh, new strategic role as direct, Senior Director of Indigenous Initiatives and to uh, come back to us at this institution. So please join me in a warm welcome for Jean Becker. Say go. Watch it. Tansi. So first of all, I just want to um, I just want to give thanks for the beautiful day we've had today. I was so um, so fortunate. I had to walk over here. And, um, you know, just, just being outside in the fresh air and, and with that warm sun on my face was so exquisite. I, I just am so happy to be here. And I'm also so happy and so grateful that you've all come and uh, are spending this time with us. I'd like to say thank you to Sheila for that really warm welcome and to Lori for that really beautiful introduction and um, to the drum group. So happy to have you all come and sing that beautiful song. I was sorry it was only one. <laughs> so when Lori asked and uh, Susan Roy, whom I also like to acknowledge from um, the history department here, invited me to come and and speak with you today. Um, they said that I could uh, talk about myself, the most fascinating topic I can think of. <laughs> so I hope you think so. <laughs> so I'm just going to start and, and tell you a little bit about who I am, where I came from, and as Lori already said, I'm Inuk. I, um, my homelands, where I came from, where I was born and grew up, was um, Nunatsiavut, which is in the Labrador Territory. And um, I uh, left home, obviously, a very long time ago. I've lived here in this region for 40 years. Prior to that, I spent about 10 years in the United States. So as you can tell, I'm extremely old. <laughs> Um, I think I think what I uh, what I want to what I want to really say about about I really want want to leave you today with a little sense of who I am and and the work that I hope to do here, but also um, a bit of a sense of where I'm coming from as an indigenous person, as a, as a um, Inuk woman living here in Kitchener, Waterloo, and um, in 20, what year, 2020, yes, 2020. <laughs> so I, I arrived in uh, Ontario. I spent probably about six years my first six years here working in, um, I was a waitress in, uh, in the Mohawk Inn on, the, on Highway 401 and out there by Campbellville. You've probably passed it a million times. Spent about six years waitressing and um, then I decided I was going to find alternative employment. I was looking for more money. I, unfortunately made the choice of um, going and uh, working with my husband in a automotive repair shop where I became a, I ended up being the engine repair mechanic. <laughs> so I was repairing, this is air-cooled engines, mind you, so don't ask me to fix the ones you're driving today, but... Um, 
Anyway, I learned to uh, learn to repair engines. I was pretty good. I had a lot of uh, clientele and followers until I realized that I didn't have a pension, <laughs> nor any savings, nor likely to get any. So I decided, well, what does one do? And I had a couple of friends, one in particular, Catherine Edgecombe was um, just finishing off university and um, she was older than I am, so I thought, well, if she can do that, I could do that. So it inspired me to apply to the University of Guelph. They let me in for a couple of courses. And um, I eventually ended up with a master's degree over there. But the other day, my husband, you know, oh, I don't know what got into him. He was cleaning up. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't happen frequently. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> he was cleaning up and he discovered this student ID card. And you know, that student ID was dated 1979 and it was for the uh, University of Waterloo. I had forgotten I was a student here once. 1971, 79, I enrolled in an English course at the University of Waterloo. And <laughs> I took a course on Chaucer. <laughs> Have you ever tried to read Chaucer? <laughs> I actually passed the course. <laughs> But I, um, that was the last anybody saw of me in a university for about eight years, so. <laughs> but that just illustrates how lengthy my history with the university actually is. And I've been thinking about it, you know, like, I wonder how I got in here. I didn't even have a high school diploma at the time. <laughs> Somehow they let me take that course. Probably doesn't happen today, I suspect. <laughs> so I, um, I went through the undergrad, the master's degree. I started a PhD, and during that time, I also started teaching a course here. It was taught out of St. Paul's. At that time, um, the principal over there was, was a gentleman named uh, Bob Needham. And um, he had an interest in supporting indigenous things. But really, where, where that course came from was um, community. There was a woman working here in the grad studies an Anishinaabe woman, who at that time was probably the only indigenous student support in the institution. She's here today, actually, so I'd love to introduce her to you later. Her name is Elaine Garner, and um, she spent 33 years here at this university, and all of the indigenous graduate students in, in the, at that time have never forgotten her, have um, been so grateful to her forever for the support and the help that she gave them. And she also is the person who um, was one of the founders of what is now the White Owl Native Ancestry Association, which has been a long-term uh, community group here. She was on that found in that founding group. And um, she and Carol Cooper, who was a PhD student at that time. And I believe there was some input from um, Diane Mitchell, who is a Mi'kmaq linguist, who 
spent many years living in Kitchener. They, they are the, the three people who really started any kind of indigenous events, um, support for indigenous students in this local area. And um, out of the work they did, that one course started over at St. Paul's. It was funny because uh, I, I ended up teaching that course for a few years and um, it was cross-listed between anthropology, I think history, and native studies, of which there were none. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I believe that course is still being taught, maybe by Lori Campbell. So my relationship with the University of Waterloo goes back quite a while. I, following um, a number of years teaching that one course in St. Paul's in the evenings, three-hour course once a week. I was hired as the first Aboriginal support coordinator at St. Paul's when there was no center, there was not, I had an office over there. And I had, um, I had a small but active group of students that first year. One of them is here, Lou Lentz is here. Lou was one of my um, early students. Um, a young man named uh, Will Laval, who is Jeanette Laval's a famous woman in, in indigenous history in Canada. Her son was here. And um, Lori Paulus was here. She's. Uh, now a teacher out at Six Nations. So we have a history. I have a history in this region. And I have, um, I have a, a very great love for, for the people that I've worked with and the people that, um, that I'm in community with here. I was really fortunate to have the um, opportunity to meet and to learn from a number of elders during those, those years when I first started working at the university in, at St. Paul's. Um, at Ernie Benedict, Jake Thomas, and... Um, I was even more fortunate to have the opportunity to uh, do ceremony with a lot of Anishinaabe elders. The first, um, the first elder that, that I really learned from was Art Solomon and his wife, Eva. They actually took me to the very first ceremony I went to. And um, on Kate Croker, Winona, Ariega, Ella Walkie, Carolyn Oliver. And then I was um, very, very gifted with, I was adopted into a Sundance family in Manitoba. I've Sundanced in Manitoba for about 20 years. And um, and then I had um, a Cree elder from Sandy Lake in Northern Ontario, Pathfinder. Peter Linklater was his English name. So I've been really um, gifted with a lot of teachings around uh, and sacred teachings from the Anishinaabe people. And I never uh, had that opportunity when I was living at home in Labrador. There was 
um, no ceremonies being done there. We didn't even, during the years when I was growing up, the drums were no longer in Labrador. As you can imagine, when the Europeans came to the Americas, we were the first people they encountered. And um, the Christianization of the Inuit in Labrador started in 1763, which is considerably older than many parts of this country. So many of the, including the drums, have returned to Labrador today, but they returned after I left there. And they returned because people from there were going to places like pound makers in Alberta, and they were being taught, retaught, because we know that we had sweat lodges, we had shaking tents, we had ceremony at home at one time. One of the um, things that I did as a result of my relationship with Art Solomon was um, Art was one of the elders who began um, teaching and holding ceremony in the prisons across Ontario. One of the institutions back then was uh, the Guelph Correctional Institute. So um, Art said to, said to me one day, you know, you should be going in there. It's our responsibility as Indigenous people is to go in there and to witness, to witness what's happening to our, in this case it was a men's institute, to our brothers in, inside those places. So as a result of that, I spent about seven years running a program called Tough Talk. <laughs> I was tough. <laughs> and um, <laughs> in, in later years, you know, some of the men that I worked with in, in, in that particular institution became really involved in ceremony. And there's one in particular who is a, a recognized elder at, at powwows and uh, is quite often um, involved in, in a lot of the events, even, even ones that we hold in our local area. And, and th through that, I really learned the value, you know, of our ceremonies and, and what it means to hear those drums and to really, to really understand and to, to walk with them in the way that I know many of the women who are here today do, to walk with them in a relationship. So after, um, after I left Laurier, after I left Waterloo or St. Paul's, I spent um, the past 13 and a half years at Laurier. I initially went there because I had the opportunity to work in the Faculty of Social Work there to help to build something that didn't exist. And that was an indigenous field of study and a Master's of Social Work program. And the intention was to create a program that was grounded in indigenous theory indigenous practice, indigenous methodology, using indigenous scholars. And we did that. It's, um, it's in its 16th year, I think. 2006. I don't, terrible with math, but I think it's about 16 years they've, they've been running that program and they've graduated over 250 indigenous social workers with master's degrees out of that program. So this is 
this is the kind of thing that I hope I will be able to do here to, um, to begin to decolonize the institution that we're all working in, to begin to create space, not just for indigenous people either, because, you know, we always say when we do this work, this indigenous inclusion, indigenous knowledge, it's for everybody. And it benefits everybody. Even the presence of it in an institution will change that institution. And I've seen it, I've seen it happen. And I'm so excited that it could happen here. This, I've only been here for two, less than two weeks. <laughs> so I'm kind of busy and I'm kind of, you know, just really being present to how big this institution is. And, um, and, and I've discovered quite a few exciting things that may or may not be talked about today, but um, I'm really, I'm really looking forward to the coming year or years, and um, I'm, uh, I'm really grateful that you're all here to begin this with me today. Thank you for sharing um, your stories with us, Jean. Um, now we're uh, just going to move. I'm going to um, say a few things, uh, summarize a few comments that Jean has made, and we have uh, a few questions that uh, we've come up with already that we want to explore a little further. And we have a couple mic runners, I think. So uh, as questions come up from the crowd, you can raise your hand, and we will uh, get a mic out to you also to ask questions. Again, just one more round of applause for Jean. Thank you. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, kind of where you went with, with throughout your story, I think that is so important to pay attention to and that we need to think about is, um, you know, you, you gave us the genealogy, the, the lineage of um, Indigenous initiatives at this university and, uh, you know, the uh, work and the, and the um, promotion of that and decolonizing work, I, you know, I think, uh, you know, dates all the way back to when Elaine started here and um you know the fact that at this point you know there, there's several of us in the room is part in parcel of the work that was done previous and um and i, I as uh, you know the next generation coming up i just really want to thank you for that and and elaine and for the work that you've done to to create that space so that we can be here and that we can continue to do that and that we could have all those drummers come up here and some of them who are um, in uh, high school students in our community who who um, are learning that there is space here for for them and that we value them as indigenous peoples and uh, so I, I just, I, I thank you and, and Elaine both for that work. Thank you so much. You sparked some things that I didn't really know about you. So I'm just, I'm gonna ask a couple of random questions that I was curious about. Um, when you went to Guelph, what were you studying at Guelph? Um, I was studying uh, sociology and anthropology. And I was doing that because I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. My idea at the time was I was going to get a, a, a university degree, a BA, and then I was going to go to teacher's college and I was going to have the summers off. <laughs> <laughs> that was all I could think of was having summers off. <laughs> So anyway, I took sociology because the woman who was doing the Sociology 101 course that particular year was a woman named Francoise Boudreau. Francoise was young, blonde, um, and 
mighty enthusiastic. <laughs> I, was, I was enthralled. <laughs> I had no idea sociology was so exciting. <laughs> but she sure made it sound exciting. I, as I got into it, I found out it wasn't always that exciting. <laughs> And, I, and eventually, I never saw her anymore, but <laughs> that's how I got into sociology. And then I discovered anthropology. And that actually led me into what I did in the university, which was indigenous studies, self-created, in courses that had nothing to do with indigenous anything. I would find topics around indigenous something or other, and um, then I would write about it, and my professors would be like, what do I know? <laughs> this could be right or could be wrong. I know nothing about this stuff. <laughs> but that's how I got the degree. I think, and I think that's also an important you know, thing that uh, you know, maybe people don't know, but um, you know, our, our histories were studied somewhat within anthropology because yeah. um, you know, before we became our own departments of indigenous you know, native studies, indigenous studies that's now moved into, because we were not meant to be here. We were not meant to you know, be in these spaces. And so the way to preserve us was um, the non-indigenous people studying about us and they were going to document everything and keep it and house it within anthropology. Um, so I think that's also another uh, important piece of sort of our lineage and how it is that we, you know, have come to have our own departments now and in particular, you know, that graduate program in indigenous social work is, uh, is, really, is really awesome. It also struck me in one of the things that you said, uh, and, and I'm from Treaty 6 territory in northern Saskatchewan, so I've only been out here for three years um, and uh, have spent the rest of my life in Saskatchewan. And as much as I do and have been teaching Indigenous studies for a number of years, and I am well aware that colonization occurred on the East Coast and swept over to the West, um, I really did not know what... Um, I really did not understand that fully until I got out here. And I started to see some of these dates that uh, you, know, you spoke of in 1763 was when Christianity started uh, uh, hitting, hitting the East Coast. And, and, um, and uh, personally feeling like how um, fortunate that I feel that uh, you know, our sort of last standoff in the West was the uh, um, Battle at Batash in 1885. And so from the drum, you know, we didn't get far, re far removed from the drum, and um, and I feel very, very lucky that uh, that um, that's been my experience, and and um, and I've heard also the stories that you've been telling about people coming out west to learn, and then to take it back yeah. to the east, and and I think that's just a really beautiful, a beautiful thing that's occurred. I had some preset questions here now. That was just, that was just a few, few things about... Um, so think about questions. If anybody has a question, you can raise your hand. The mic will uh, come to you, and I will pose one other question in um, the meantime. Um, one of the questions that uh, we've been thinking about, and, and, uh, and, and for folks that have been here certainly longer in this community than I have, um, do you think, or what's your experience been about there being a grow, growing awareness of indigenous issues um, in this region, uh, whether you know whether it's within the institutions themselves, because you're familiar with the um, the, the two uh, universities quite well, or within like the KW region? Like, what what have you seen over um, those forty years? I guess. Um, there's certainly right now it, there there's um, is the height. Of, of interest in indigenous issues. And I would say the, um, even though the understanding and the knowledge of the issues still tends to be quite um, shallow for most people, we're still dealing mostly with people who have not been taught anything. So the schools, um, up until very, very recently, and some of them are still not doing it. So, so you know, we are still producing children out of high school who don't have any background, but we have an increasing number who do. And one of the things that I, I was always really aware of when I was teaching 
Indigenous Studies courses is that my students would sometimes come to me and say, oh, ever since I started taking this class, I've been doing nothing but fight with my family. So, you know, there are a lot of assumptions about Indigenous people that, that are generally like commonplace knowledge in Canada. We all have a free education, we don't pay taxes. Uh, I don't know, it, it always sounds to me like they must think we own all those yachts up on the, up, you know. I'm always mesmerized with these yachts. Anyway, <laughs> I've never met an Indigenous person with one, but I imagine Canadians think they're all ours. <laughs> and because they think that we have all this, these um, privileges. Mm -hmm. And um, and so anyway, as they're, you know, going through a 12-week course with me, these young people would go home, you know, for Christmas and find themselves in big arguments with their families because somebody might say something or something on the news and somebody would make a remark and then they'd have to explain it all to them, <laughs> the whole course over dinner. <laughs> So I'm really aware that right now, and you know, one of the things that I've found in the short time I've been here at UW is that there's an unbelievable amount of interest here. People really do want to, they, they want to know. And, um, and they're actively going after it. Mm -hmm. So... This is, um, it, it's way better, way more of this than I expected. Mm. So it's changed a lot in 40 years, a great deal in 40 years, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think that's very exciting. And I do mm -hmm. teach that class, um, or a version of that class in, in mm -hmm. contemporary issues. And, and uh, one of the things that you know struck me, this is the third time um, that we've that has, uh, you know, I've been involved with it, and this, the number of students in the class has actually doubled. And um, students are, because it's an uh, optional class, students are coming from all six faculties. Yes. You know, we, we have math students and engineers and, and um, um, science students uh, coming to take that with a really high interest in wanting to learn and wanting to have those conversations and, and uh, you know, oftentimes feeling like, um, you know, there was this gap in their K-12 education. And um, I think that's, that is really, really exciting here for sure. Does anybody have a question yet? Sorry, it's always hard to see out there. Okay, there's one, there's one over there somewhere. I can't quite see it. But, um, okay, Emma's there. Hi, friends. How are you? Um, this is, I'm Laura May. Um, I am a huge fan of both uh, Jean Becker and Laurie Campbell, so hi. Um, hi. I have a real question. So I am the MPP for Kitchener Centre. Um, and one of the things that I know is that there have been uh, very few investments from the province in uh, the university sector. <laughs> happen to know that. And, um, but I do also know that letter writing campaigns and calls to MPPs can actually make big changes. So um, if everybody in this room was to start like a letter writing campaign asking for concrete investments to better support you as you're starting this brand new journey, what kinds of concrete things would you ask them for and um, they could email them to me, that would be awesome. Wow. <laughs> Where should we start the list? Uh, what kind of concrete things could the province do? Well, you know, um, Indigenous Student Services has received funding from the province since... Um, I never remember the year, but 1980-something, they started an Indigenous, and some, some Indigenous uh, education funding for post-secondary institutions. They've expanded it a couple of times, and, um, uh, but it has been 
at the same level throughout all these years since around, I think it might have been 1985-ish, 83 perhaps, when they started that. They, they never increased it. <laughs> so, you know, everybody has been operating on that level of funding for a very long time with, with I mean, institutions have invested in addition to that funding, but the, the province is actually providing very little for indigenous education in post-secondary institutions. It's critical. This, this um, supporting our students in such a way that they can, first of all, come into the universities and colleges and then that they have enough support so that they can actually do their program and complete and then be able to come and work in, in whatever it is the training they're receiving is essential for our communities. When we're talking about Indigenous education, we're actually talking about the well-being and the health of our babies, our grannies, all of us. You know, this is, education is so critical to our people actually achieving self-determination. So, you know, if the, um, if the province were to initiate uh, ongoing, actual, reliable funding that we could count on to be there, and that would be in the hands of Indigenous educators, because that's a critical aspect of it as well, is that the, the funding should allow Indigenous educators, Indigenous communities to create the education in partnership with the institutions. So um, you can write letters and send them to Laura May, please. <laughs> I think, I think um, in addition to that, you know, my experience here at the University of Waterloo, I mean, this is an amazing university and we have um, a, a really high um, level of, it's really hard to get into this university. I now work at a university that certainly at that young age I would not have actually got into, uh, which I find kind of fascinating in my own head, but um, I think, you know, what, in my experience here in the last three years, there's very few students that I have to work with about their academic ability. They're um, quite well prepared for the level of work that, uh, you know, is, is demanded by this institution. What I do spend my time working with them is how to deal with racism and microaggressions that are occurring from peers on, uh, on campus, knowingly or unknowingly and uh, from staff and faculty, again, knowingly and unknowingly. And where I would like to see more um, resources uh, invested in is, is around like the anti-Indigenous racism and uh, anti-racism strategies for everybody that the students are gonna have to come in contact with. Uh, because while they're here, I, you know, they should just be able to focus on their studies like every other student instead of worrying about um, how to counter that and instead of having to come to the center for some safe, safe space where they can debrief and, and uh, you know, can um, you know, regain their confidence and feel good about themselves and, and you know, have that anger dispersed with, uh, with each other. So um, for me, that would be one thing that I, I think would be key. There was another question on Mike ran over here somewhere. Okay, thank you. Hey, Jeannie. Oh, it's hello. John Samosi. <laughs> it's, hard to, it's hard to see you because of the lights. <laughs> hello. Um, when, I, when I first started um, hanging around the education system, I saw and met a whole bunch of Native people that had absolutely no information about their culture. And, and being around the university and and being in touch with, um, Catherine and I do education things for the school boards. How vital is it 
to have that degree and walk with an eagle feather. That balance between the education and the tradition. I think it's really important, um, as you know very well, because he knows me very well. <laughs> um, throughout the years that I was actually at university, I was actually at the same time in ceremony. And um, we were in ceremony often together, so I, um, I feel that the education that I received in the university, I feel like without the ceremonies, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have succeeded in it. I wouldn't be here. And um, I remember early on when I, when I first started in the very first year, I, one of the conversations I had with Art Solomon was, I feel like I shouldn't be there. I feel like this is not for me, that it's, you know, I shouldn't, I should be in the community and doing the work there. And he told me, no, you need that degree. Stay there, get the education, and then use it to help our people. That's what he told me. And I always go back to that even now sometimes. You know, when I question how I use my time, am I using it in the way that uh, is the most beneficial? And I always remember that he said, keep at it, it'll turn out. And I, you know, working with Lori, working with the students I've worked with, um, I see the struggles. I know that it's not all straightforward, it's not all easy. But I can tell you the work that you do with those young children is invaluable. I can tell you that. And I know that my daughter works in one of the schools that you've been in. And um, you know, the healing that comes to, to those children, and she works with the really troubled children in, those, in the schools up in her district. And the... Um, the brief exposure they get to you really makes a difference. It provides something that isn't in the school, it's not in the classrooms. Um, that, that was a great question, John. I, uh, um, most people don't really know this, but I took two complete undergrads because I still wanted to go to school, but I didn't think Indigenous peoples went to grad school. So I had to do two complete undergrads in order to keep going to school. But after I was done my second undergrad, I, um, I wanted to learn more about my culture in a really sort of intentional way. And, um, and so I essentially spent four years, literally another four years, and that's what I did was learning within community and with my elders and within my family. And, um, and then, again, was told by my elders, it's like, okay, you need to go back to the institution and to get that formal education that goes along with it. But I think one of the things that you know we have a, a is, is a tremendous um, uh, you know responsibility that I think is so important. I, th I think that those of us that work in the education field take so seriously is uh, the opportunity we have to when those young people, uh, the, the younger ones in your instance, or, or are just showing up at the university for the first time and are showing up at the centers and coming to learn who they are. And when we don't when we, through uh, colonization, have lost those opportunities to learn that within our communities, the next space where young people are coming is going to be into the schools and into the education system like this. And so uh, I think you bring up a good point that there's many students that are learning, uh, for those that are faculty in the room, they're learning all the material that you're giving them as well, but they're also coming to the center and they're finding Indigenous scholarship in the fields, if you're not using it in your class, they're like looking for indigenous scholarship in the fields that they're studying. They're doing this whole other education. They're doing the ceremonies that we that uh, we provide uh, networking for on campus to do. And then those of us that are, are in these positions are still going home for the Sundance, for our fasting and, and all those ceremonies. And, um, and, and I think that is the balance of what like allows us to do this kind of work, right? Because I think without that, um, I, I, yeah, I don't think we could, 
do this work. And, it's, and uh, so I thank you also for your work too, and Jean, thank you. Is there another question? Hi. Um, so I feel like every time I hear you speak, Jeannie, I learn something new about you. And I didn't know that you went to school many times. And from a student's point of view, I guess a question I have is, what motivates you to keep going? Or what motivated you to keep going? Because, you know, there's a lot of obstacles that we have nowadays. And sometimes I just want to, like, give up and just go straight into the workforce and not further my education. But there's always a part of me that like really wants to further it. And I struggle a lot with like lack of motivation, lack of like adding fuel to my fire. And my question for you is, um, what motivated you to keep going? Because I feel like I speak for a lot of students in that perspective. Uh. Thanks for that question. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of the studying was really difficult. Like there were things I had to I had to study that I was hopeless with. You know, I had to take a, a undergrad statistics course. I mean, you know, I could barely add and subtract and everything. Do statistic, <laughs> and uh, then horrifyingly, when I got to graduate school, I had to take a graduate statistics course. <laughs> I remember one semester I accidentally took a um, biology course, which I thought was for art students, and that, but I took the wrong one, and I took the one for biology students, so it was. 10 times harder, and I didn't find out till it was too late to withdraw from it. <laughs> In that same semester, I was doing introductions to computer programming. <laughs> oh, yes, I was programming computers already. <laughs> so, what motivated me to keep going? You know, for one thing, you know, I come from an extremely determined people, as do you. I know your family, my girl. You can do it too. So there was the motivation for me that I wanted, I wanted to know that I could do it. You know, it's like, so I always had uh, more than slight suspicion that I wasn't very smart. And I, and actually that's the only reason I embarked on a PhD was because I was going to prove to myself whether or not I was smart enough to do it. <laughs> I never finished it because I figured out before I finished it that I was smart enough to do it. <laughs> I know that's a good excuse, but it is a good excuse <laughs> for not doing the work. <laughs> and you know, as a teacher in the university, do you know what I discovered? You don't have to be smart anyway. All you have to do is do the work. <laughs> so it is about plowing through sometimes when you don't feel like it, you know? It's about living your life not based on your feelings, but based on a vision. So I created for myself a vision of how I could, you know, do something. And I didn't even know what I would do with any of it. You know, like I was going to have summers off. Well, I never got them because I ended up going to grad school and then doing other things. But for you, and I'm so glad you're here, because for you, I'm waiting for you. <laughs> you named the two classes I took twice in undergrad, both stats and biology. <laughs> um, anyways, um, is there another question over here? 
I see a hand waving up over here. Um, if somebody can run a mic up over into the... I, I have a oh, question. Oh, okay, right here. Um, yeah, Lou. Well, it's not so much a question. Um, I just wanted to really congratulate Jean on coming back to UW. So Jean name dropped me in her speech, so I'm Lou. And I was one of her first students, um, and I kind of was inspired too when she talked about... Um, you know, just plowing through, and that's what Jean did for me. So I remember I was a first year student here. I came from Northern Ontario. I didn't know um, if I belonged here. And so Jean really helped me through my undergraduate years and really find that confidence and even to connect to Indigenous ceremony as well, um, because um, I, didn't, I, I didn't know a lot. I knew a little bit, but I wasn't as immersed um, when I was younger. So um, I just, yeah. Um, so Jean really, really helped me through. And I think it's that finding those people that you trust. Um, and, I, and Jean is definitely one of those people that um, really supports. Um, so University of Waterloo is so lucky to have her. Um, and she's caring and um, she'll do like she'll go up above and beyond um, e even if um, I accidentally tried to burn down her house one time so <laughs> she did try to <laughs> and that, it was totally act by accident so. but um, yeah so I just wanted to really congratulate you um, for being here and you know, I don't have a question but um, just wanted to share that she has like a major um, big heart and uh, somebody that will will go above and beyond. So actually, maybe that's one of my questions. So since you're here, um, I guess what are some of the first tasks that you're going to do at the University of Waterloo? So um, you know, my I think my biggest task is strategic. It's like um, there's a lot of work has actually been done here already. And um, there are a lot of things happening in terms of, you know, faculty like Susan who are um, already engaged in creating space for Indigenous students and, um, you know, bringing more Indigenous faculty into this community, which is really critical. If, you're, if we're going to decolonize an institution, we really need to have a critical number of Indigenous faculty working in the institution. So um, I'm, I'm finding that there's a real excitement about indigenizing curriculum and um, you know, developing working partnerships with community, with um, organizations. So I, there's so much opportunity here. And, and so I will be working on, you know, bringing people together and, and working on creating those partnerships and, um, and supporting the projects that are already underway, really, because there are quite a number of them. I've been astounded in the last few days to start learning about some of the things that are happening. The School of Pharmacy already has an indigenization strategy. So there are things already going on here that will become just more and more as time goes on. Yeah. So any faculty that are here or um, high school teachers or anything like that, I mean, your, fir your first task, and I, I know many of you in the room have already done this, but is to like look at your syllabus or your course or your class curriculum and if you aren't, uh, and, and make sure that you actually are inclusive of Indigenous scholarship in the areas and the fields that uh, you're teaching. Um, and for everybody in the room who's on social media, which is probably most of you, if you're not following Indigenous scholars or Indigenous leaders, um, in the and, and leaders, I that doesn't just you know it, it's not just our, our elder leaders, but we have some amazing young people um, across Indigenous country who are doing some amazing work, and uh, you should be following them and and uh, learning. 
and figuring out you know what it is that you don't know and, and how to decolonize your own practice and those are like really good starting points that uh, you can just take up on your own and, and have conversations with your peers and I know here at the University of Waterloo with the Faculty Association Indigenization Group there's lots of resources there and people to talk to um, you don't always uh, need to come to necessarily Jean's table or to my table, there's uh, peers that you have if you're non-Indigenous within the university that can be your first sort of check stop to um, help you learn some of the things that you're learning because some many in the room have been on the journey a little bit longer um, as well and so that's like really awesome. I think we might have time for like maybe like one more question. Okay, I'm, uh, I have a question okay. here. My name is Janice. Um, I am also of the age group where in the 70s there certainly wasn't uh, very much information about Indigenous peoples. Um, and one of the things I'm wondering and questioning is because the way we had to learn in those days is, you know, sit with elders and go on the land and work with, with the people who had the knowledge. Um, this institution it has a you know the Socratic method. There's the you know lecturing and like how how can you translate what was once a more of an oral tradition and active hands-on into this academia and what is gained and what is lost? That's um, that's really interesting because. Um, I, so when I, when I first started teaching, I knew nothing about indigenous methodology. I, there, it wasn't, it wasn't even a term, I don't believe, in, at the time when I, when I was first teaching. Um, it probably didn't come into, uh, you know, the academic vocabulary until a number of years after I started teaching. Um, but when I, when I started teaching, and I found out afterwards, because nobody taught me this and I didn't know how to do it. But I started teaching in circle. So, and I, and I didn't have small classes. I had as many as 60 or 70 students in my classes, but I did them. I created ways of doing them in circles. So one of the comments that my students frequently made at the end of my courses was, this is the first time in four years that I have made friends and formed relationships in a class. Because most of the classes, you come into a room such as you're sitting in now, you'd take notes, you'd listen to lectures, and then you go away, and you never talk to anybody. That was my experience in the classrooms. But in my classes, everybody talked to everybody. And it was part of the learning was the discourse with other students. So, yes, this is, you know, the lecture, the Socratic method, the critical thinking, um, all of that is certainly the standard. But what I, what I know is that Indigenous people are teaching differently all over the country. And we're, we're doing it in the same classrooms where all these other methods are being used, but we are using our own methods. And when we create, you know, assignments, we create them differently. And they work. They work. We end up with students who, who have the knowledge that we're, you know, the outcomes that we create, we deliver on them through our own methodology. So indigenous methodologies are doable. They're doable in any institution. And they're just as effective. So that's my answer. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, I, think, I think it's also important to keep in mind too, like, um, you know, we have indigenous people and, and you know, across, across this land and my, one of my elders in the lodge I belong to, you know, reminds me of this as well. Like we have 
indigenous people who are, um, you know, in the institutions taking up scholarship in this way. We have indigenous people who are still out, who aren't coming into the post-secondary, but are running our land-based camps and teaching the languages in, in community and, and the traditions and the culture and those kinds of things. I think it's, um, you know, we need to uh, uphold the diversity of indigeneity um, for all the roles that we're all fulfilling because, uh, you know, if we, if we do look historically, we all had roles within the community that were all needed in order for our societies to, to survive and, and to thrive. Um, I think, you know, myself, I teach to use a lot of story and, and really focus on trans, transformational learning um, for my students. But it's important to also know that it's, you know, 2020 and all cultures, um, you know, the, the, the uh, evolve and, and advance over time. And at this point in time, we are in the academy, and this is this is what's going what's going on. And there's room for uh, changes within indigenous culture. So, um, you know, it doesn't uh, things don't need to remain exactly as they were a hundred years ago for indigenous peoples uh, any more than they need to remain uh, as they as they were a hundred years ago for Euro Canadian settlers. Um, but still having that strong linkage to our evolution. And I think what I think when I think about indigenous cultures is unfortunate we had this huge like a break of, uh, you know, where things came to a nasty, horrible stop because of colonization. And so we have had to back up and go spend time with our lodgers and relearn as adults, many of us, to make those connections. But, um, you know, what I, what I foresee and hope with the younger ones coming up is that those connections will be made and soon in a few more generations, um, we will see even more of the young people uh, who aren't coming into the university setting for the first time to learn about themselves from Indigenous people here. They will be able to reclaim that and learn that within the communities because of all the work that we're doing and has been done before us. I think, I don't see that there's like any other burning question and I, and I think it's about getting time to wrap up here. Um, so I think that's uh, what we will do. I do have um, a gift for Jean. <laughs> Because there's always like gifts and and uh, important things, but I just another just round of applause. Thank you, Jean, for all of your work here. We're we're so glad you're back. Um, it's just uh, come really full circle for us. And uh, when I first moved to Waterloo, um, Jean was one of the first people that I actually sought out because I realized I was here and I didn't know who my elders were. And so Jean was one of those people that I reached out to right away. And um, and I'm just very grateful that now we actually uh, will get to like work together a little bit more. It's so hard for us to see each other at both universities. We've been so busy. So this is very exciting for us. So thank you so much.